on, on behalf of the department, I want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's uh, training, Heroes Kickoff for Partner Rollouts. <clears throat> My name is Greg Byrne, and I oversee the transaction division within the Office of Recapitalization. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of work under the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, but also work under Section 236 and Mark to Market. Uh, and we're one of the main users of our HERO system. Um, we are extremely excited to be at the point we're at now where we can actually uh, make the HERO system available to our partners. And in a little bit, we're going to talk about what we mean by a partner. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about also sort of the stage rollout in terms of sort of what programs will come first in terms of using um, uh, HEROs. And then uh, most importantly, we're going to talk about how you use heroes. Um, but um, uh, but before we uh, hand the program over to our two presenters, which are going to be uh, Sarah Jensen, who's the Housing's Program Environmental Compliance Officer, as well as Liz Cepeda, who is uh, from the Office of Environment and Energy, a Senior Environmental Specialist. Uh, but first, we're going to uh, hear from Dan Sullivan, the Acting uh, production director for FHA. Dan. Hi, Greg. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. I appreciate being able to join you and Brad and uh, also Sarah Jensen and Liz Zapata in welcoming our external partners to these HEROES kickoff for partner rollout training. Mm -hmm. As you'll see, they've put an enormous amount of work into developing both these instructional sides, but also to make the technical IT modifications to the HERO system to permit industry partners to directly input environmental information uh, concerning proposed sites for uh, mortgage insurance into the HERO system. Specifically, the modification uh, will allow industry partners to directly input information that otherwise would be done by HUD staff. HUD staff is happy to do it, but it will save the lenders um, time if their third parties actually link um, the information and upload uh, the information that we need in reviewing and processing the applications. Uh, at the same time, and as will be discussed in this presentation, HUD staff remains legally responsible for environmental determinations. And then the communications pathways between the third party and lender partners um, and, uh, and owners and so on program staff at HUD and the environmental field officers within HUD, all of those same communication uh, protocols remain in place. As Greg mentioned, uh, consultants, or as Liz or Sarah will mention, consultants and PHAs are encouraged to start using HEROES starting uh, today. However, due to a technical issue, the rollout for FHA's multifamily insurance programs is delayed until May. Um, we were disappointed with that, but uh, made the technical IT decision that it'd be better to wait than to stumble around. That said, um, although you're, you can do any RAD deals, including if it has mortgage insurance now, but if it's a normal FHA multifamily insurance deal, uh, that will be delayed until May. Uh, but that said, um, the training today will be helpful both as you use the partner's worksheets um, until May, which you've been encouraged to do and invited to do, though not required. Um, and then uh, we'll queue you up for uh, easier transition once we get to opening it up to all multifamily mortgage insurance skills starting in May. Um, so uh, with that, I just wanted to say thank you. And uh, again, my uh, sincere thanks to both Liz Zapata and Sarah Jensen for their leadership on this uh, effort. It's helping us uh, uh, ensure compliance and I think ultimately going to make our uh, jobs easier and uh, faster so we can better serve our clients. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Dan. Greg, did you want to go over the agenda or do you want me to take it away? Go ahead. Just take it from here if you want, if you don't mind. Okay, great. Um, so here is a summary of what Dan just talked about with the dates of the rollout. And then if you go one more, you can see an overview um, of the agenda. This is what we're planning to talk about today. And let me do a couple minutes of housekeeping before we start. So first, if you have a question, what we'd like you to do is press the little hand, raise hand button and you can then uh, type in your question. There's also a box where you can type in a question. 
and we have uh, Robert reviewing those and he will be um, letting us know if there are questions. Um, also on your screen under a title handout, you should see a copy of the slides. And these are in full page format. Some of them get, with the screenshots, get really hard to see. So these are full screen uh, slides that you can print and take notes on or have for future reference. Okay, so with that, let's move on to um, the next slide. And we thought that we would start out today talking just for a little bit about why we conduct environmental reviews. So in the big picture, we're ensuring that HUD projects meet the HUD mission, which is providing decent, safe, and sanitary housing. Um, the, of course, another reason is that the National Environmental Policy Act requires this, and the NEPA requires each agency to adopt a systemic approach to decision-making that considers environmental issues. And because it revolves around decision making, this step has to take place before HUD commits resources or the project starts construction. So it needs to take place early on. Um, our analysis is both of the impact of a project on the surrounding environment. So for example, we wanna make sure that we're not putting our project on top of a wetland or paving over an endangered species nest. And we also look at the impact of the surrounding environment on the project. So we wanna make sure that residents are not exposed to toxic hazards or to unacceptable levels of noise, for example. So we're looking at both of those things. And HUD requirements for the programs that we're talking about today. Um, so the HUD requirements when HUD staff complete the environmental reviews are laid out in 24 CFR part 50. And of course, you're all, familiar with the program specific requirements. So RAD and Multifamily FHA both use chapter nine of the MAP guide. And then there's some additional RAD guide environmental guidance. And at the end of this presentation, there are links to both of those documents for your reference. So let's go to the next slide, um, the environmental review record. So this is what HEROES is. Um, it used to be the required form was HUD 4128. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, that is now morphed into HEROES form 4128. And as you know, RAD and multifamily FHA staff have been using HEROES internally for several years. And what HEROES is, is the NEPA administrative record for each project. It's where we uh, document all of the determinations and findings where we upload all of the maps and reports that are generated and put together basically the, the record of the NEPA decision. Um, once it's finished, this is a publicly available document. And so when HUD finishes its review at the end of the process, these actually get posted in HEROES um, for a year. Let's talk about what this means for you, our valued partners. So it really doesn't change your role in this process. So um, under part 50, applicants and third parties may prepare supporting documentation. And in fact, the map guide sets up the process so that HUD really relies on our third parties to supply this, this documentation. But HUD does must independently evaluate that documentation and ultimately sign off on the environmental review. So there's a process of reviewing, supplementing, asking questions, appending additional information. There's some back and forth once uh, the documentation comes in from you. And there are certain aspects of the environmental review that must be completed by HUD. A key example is writing tribes under historic preservation compliance. Those letters must come from HUD because it's a government to government consultation. There are a few other points too where letters must come from HUD and so that's laid out in the guidance, and I think we talk about some of it a little bit later. Um, one key, just before we move on to hero specific, is that this is really a collaborative effort with information coming from the third parties, HUD's review, there may be some back and forth, and that doesn't change with, with heroes. In fact, it, it helps that collaborative effort. So Liz, let me turn it over to you to talk about heroes specifically. All right. Uh, so HEROES is kind of a relatively new system. Uh, it's been in use for about four years, so we're kind of starting to get the hang of it. Um, the purpose is to um, 
standardize environmental review requirements across all HUD programs and regions. So we're replacing program-specific formats, like the 4128, uh, with a single system that works across HUD. Um, so it's consistent for Part 50 and Part 58, every region, every program. Um, it's also intended to provide guidance throughout the environmental review process. So instead of asking you to kind of figure out the requirements by yourself and just write them down on a form, uh, HEROES provides a little more guidance. Uh, there are still some hiccups when it comes to partner users. Um, it isn't perfect, but we think it's close enough to, to get going um, on the, with the knowledge that we're going to continue to run into some small problems. So we ask for your patience. Uh, we're also really happy to get feedback on what we could improve, what is and isn't working. So please keep talking to us. Um, this slide just gives you kind of a preview of how HEROES looks before we get into the details. So you have a sense of what HEROES looks like, what's coming. Um, HEROES takes you from defining the sources of HUD assistance um, to doing a project description, click, um, to determining the level of review, complying with all required federal environmental laws, and for environmental assessments, the additional analysis that goes into complying with the National Environmental Policy Act. So since 2014, we've been making HEROES available to one program at a time so that we can focus on training each program and addressing their individual needs as users. So um, RAD was one of our earliest programs to begin using HEROES for Part 50 reviews, uh, and RAD transaction managers have been using HEROES to complete all their reviews um, since summer of 2015. Um, and after that, we rolled out to FHA multifamily production with the 2016 MAP guide updates. And HUD staff in that program have been using HEROES for their reviews since uh, that MAP guide update. Now they are very excited to welcome you all into HEROES uh, so that you can help out and, and make HEROES work better. So if you work with RAD, you should be getting an email with your login ID and password uh, so that you should be able to access HEROES right away, hopefully very soon. Um, if you register through FHA, there will be a delay. Uh, you can keep registering. We'll keep processing your requests, um, but we won't send you your login information until we're ready to roll out. Um, so we wanted to email everyone who registered to assist with the RAD reviews today um, so that you can log in, but we hit a snag with processing some of your access requests. Um, it's generally nothing to worry about, but if you haven't gotten an email from us yet, you should get one uh, hopefully early next week. Um, some of you will have a slightly longer delay, just a little housekeeping, uh, because we got incomplete access requests from some of you. Um, so we can't process your access until we address that, but uh, I should be reaching out to you today or tomorrow so we can keep things moving. So keep an eye out for an email from me about something that we need. Um, at this point, there are only two HUD programs uh, that are ready or just about ready uh, to work with partner users and heroes. Um, that being RAD and FHA multifamily. So uh, please do not enter any environmental reviews for HEROES for any other HUD program, including healthcare or hospital programs, public housing, or CPD programs. Uh, we intend to roll out to CPD and public housing programs later this year, and there will be a separate rollout and training process associated with those programs when we're ready to go. All right, so these are the major parties involved in completing a Part 50 review for RAD and multifamily. Um, the HUD preparer is the person who's kind of legally responsible for completing the environmental review. Uh, for RAD, that's the transaction manager, and for FHA multifamily, it's the underwriters and appraisers. Next, we have you all, the partners who assist the HUD preparer. Uh, these include third-party third consultants and contractors, public housing authorities, and applicants. We rely on these partners to provide project information and a lot of the initial analysis and documentation to support HUD's environmental review. And finally, we have the environmental clearance officers. Um, in addition to providing training and technical assistance, environmental clearance officers are required to review and comment on all Part 50 environmental assessments affecting over 200 units. Um, and these are field environmental officers, regional environmental officers, and program environmental clearance officers like Sarah. There are four basic user roles in HEROES, each with different associated privileges. Um, two of those only come up for Part 58 reviews. Those are responsible entities and state agencies, so we aren't going to worry about those today. 
Um, but for purposes today, we're going to focus on HUD and partner users. Uh, HUD users include both the HUD preparer, the appraisers, underwriters, and transaction managers, as well as the environmental clearance officers who help them and review larger environmental reviews, and the supervisors and approving officials who sign off on reviews. And partner users, of course, are you all, the consultants, contractors, recipients, and applicants who facilitate HUD's environmental review. When it's available, so later on this year, hopefully kind of this summer, uh, this is also the user role that will assist responsible entities with Part 58 reviews. I want you to be aware of how this is set up in the system so that you kind of have an idea of how this works. Um, we're going to use Jane Doe as an example. Jane is employed by Enviro Professionals, Inc., a hopefully fake consultant firm. Um, in Heroes, Jane is associated with Enviro Professionals as her partner organization. Enviro Professionals has been contracted by three different organizations to assist with their environmental reviews, uh, Fairfax County and Alexandria, which are both responsible entities, and a third organization that requires HUD to complete a Part 50 review. That third organization might be a lender working with FHA or a public housing authority working with RAD. So depending on her user privileges, Jane can assist Fairfax and Alexandria with Part 58 reviews and HUD with Part 50 reviews. Each partner organization or each partner user must be associated with at least one partner organization and each partner organization must in turn be associated with at least one responsible entity or HUD. So you might be wondering uh, where that lender or public housing authority that hired Jane fits into all of this. Um, Heroes as a system doesn't really need to know about that relationship. If the lender organization or public housing authority has Heroes access, that organization uh, would also be associated with HUD, and Jane would be able to share her environmental reviews with that organization. Uh, for example, if the public housing authority wants the opportunity to review her environmental uh, entries before it's assigned to HUD, that's perfectly fine with the RAD team. Uh, you'll just need to work that out amongst yourself, and we'll talk more about how that will work later on at the end of this training. So these next couple slides compare how the process is changing for this rollout, or with this rollout. Uh, right now, you're assembling various documents, maps, and analysis, and sending that to HUD. Then the HUD preparer uh, takes everything you've sent them and inputs it into Heroes, including uploading all of your documents. Best case scenario, uh, you use the partner worksheets, which mirror the screens in Heroes, so that the HUD preparer can easily follow the same steps and logic between your submissions in Heroes. But if you aren't using those worksheets, or if you send them all of your documents in one big PDF, it can kind of create some headaches for the HUD preparers who have to translate your submission into something that works for Heroes. So starting today for RAD and soon for FHA, uh, we'll streamline that process by having you input your documents and analysis directly into Heroes. If you have been using the partner worksheets, this should be pretty familiar as those worksheets are based off of the hero screens. And this is the same slide from HUD's perspective. Currently, they're taking your submission, reviewing it to make sure it's complete and satisfactory, uploading everything into heroes, and making all findings and determinations that have to be made by HUD, um, and then getting all the signatures, all the certifications on the review. So starting with this rollout, they're still going to have to do most of that. Uh, they still have to review everything you give and make sure it meets their standards, um, and they have to complete all requirements that can only be done by HUD. However, they won't have to do all the uploading and inputting of the initial project information. That means we won't be duplicating a lot of effort, and we're going to make the environmental review process go a lot smoother and faster. So now we'll get into the mechanics of how to complete your responsibilities in HEROES. Uh, first, we want to draw your attention to the cheat sheets we've prepared to help you with this. Uh, the cheat sheets de detail how each program would like partners to complete environmental reviews for their projects. So this will tell you how to respond to key prompts and questions, uh, whether that's the correct response for the program or a placeholder that HUD will replace later. And then HUD employees are going to be responsible for reviewing all the information provided and supplementing that information if needed. These are basically the steps in the environmental review process. Uh, the good thing about HEROES is that it takes you through all of these steps with guidance and regulations integrated along the way. Uh, so we start with initiating the review, including defining the project, then determining the level of review, 
and complying and documenting compliance with the related laws and authorities, and finalizing the review, including making all findings and determinations. Those first three steps are generally going to be initiated by a partner user, with a HUD user coming in after to confirm their work and make final determinations. Uh, the fourth step has to be done by HUD. Uh, only HUD can complete those last steps to complete and sign off on the review. Short term, uh, the partner user must be the one to start the review. We should be fixing this bug in the spring, uh, but until then, if a HUD user starts a review, they will not later be able to assign it to a partner user. Uh, we don't anticipate this being a major issue since it really makes more sense for the partner user to start the review anyway. Um, but we anticipate it could cause some snags in these first couple weeks as we get going. So uh, note that HUD staff will not be able to assign reviews that they've already started to you as a partner uh, without some kind of time-consuming intervention and help from the HEROES team. Uh, so when you log into HEROES, uh, you'll see this screen where you'll need to select your profile. So our example, Jane Doe, first selects Enviro Professional, um, and then whichever responsible entity or HUD she's currently working with. For now, you might not need to select anything at all, or you'll select the name of your organization and HUD. This screen um, could get more complex if your organization gets associated with any responsible entities after we roll out CPD and public housing. Um, so once we get there, you'll actually need to log out and log back in every time you switch your profile. So um, if Jane was working on a Part 50 review, she would select Enviro Professionals and HUD, which is what you would select. Um, if after that she wanted to work on a Part 58 review for Alexandria, she would need to log out and log back in so she can choose that profile. It's a little clunky. All right, once you have selected your profile, you'll go to the My Environmental Reviews dashboard. Um, when you have reviews you're working on, either a review that you started or one that someone assigned to you, they'll all appear here and you can select one to edit. Um, so you can see this one's blank. When you first log in, you're probably just going to have a blank dashboard unless someone has already assigned a review to you. You might be wondering what I mean uh, when I talk about a review being assigned to you. Each review in Heroes has one assigned user at a time, and only the current assigned user can edit that review. So when you start a new review, you're automatically the assigned user. Um, no one else can edit that review until you assign it to them, at which point you will no longer be able to edit it because they're the assigned user. So we'll get back to that more later. Uh, when you're ready to start a new environmental review, uh, press the Start a New Review button to get started. There it is. Um, all right, so next slide. This is the first screen you'll see when you start a new review. Uh, it's screen 1101, Review Type. Uh, you'll notice at the top of each screen there's a number, uh, the title of that screen, and you'll see non-tiered. Um, that's a good way to check and make sure that you haven't accidentally made a tiered review. Um, when you're working with Part 50, that's, you're not going to want a tiered review, so it's a good confirmation that you're working in the kind of standard environmental review format. Uh, select Part 50 when you're working with HUD on an environmental review. Um, if you're logged in with HUD, you shouldn't be able to get this wrong. Uh, you should see Part 58 is grayed out and you can only select Part 50, uh, but you can't change the selection later, so it's important to be careful. Check here and make sure that you're selecting Part 50. And this is screen 1105, the initial screen. On this screen, you'll input a lot of the basic information on the HUD programs involved in the project, the project's financial situation, and the parties involved. This is a fairly complicated screen uh, with some less than intuitive questions. Uh, so we get into a lot of detail on how to complete this one on the cheat sheets. So the next couple of slides show you how we want you to complete this screen for both RAD and FHA multifamily. Each row represents a field on this screen. Um, and then the middle column tells you how to complete the field for RAD reviews. The right column tells you how to complete it for multifamily production. Um, in all cases, it's HUD's responsibility to confirm your entries and enter any missing information, including replacing your placeholders with real information. But um, So this is really everything you have to do on this screen. You would first give the project a name um, with RAD. They ask you to include the name of the current building and or the AMP in the project name. Um, in multifamily, name of the building is generally going to be the way to go. Um, 
for grant or project ID number, you would enter either the PIC ID or the FHA project number. Then there'll be a series of pull downs where you can select the HUD program involved. Um, for RAD, you'll just have to do one pull down, which is RAD. Um, for multifamily, you'll first pick housing, multifamily FHA, and then the specific program, whether that's 221D4, 223S, whatever. Um, for all the funding amounts, you should just enter zero. Uh, HUD will come in after you and provide a final number there. Uh, then we get some somewhat more intuitive questions. Um, <laughs> the trickiest one here is probably, does this project anticipate the use of funds or assistance from another federal agency in addition to HUD? Um, note, if the project involves LIHTC, that's that does not count for purposes of this question because you don't have to do an environmental review for that. Um, so the purpose of this question is to get at whether you might want to do a um, cooperating agency agreement with another agency. It's highly unlikely for RAD or multifamily. Uh, this would be something that would come up more on like a CBD type project that might be uh, using funds from another agency as well. Uh, then you'll provide information on the applicant or grant recipient as well as uh, the consultant and the HUD preparer. Uh, for the HUD preparer, you would enter the name of your transaction manager if you know who that is, um, or TBD if you don't. Um, likewise, you would enter the name of the assigned underwriter or appraiser, or TBD if you don't know who that is yet. Um, for applicants or grant recipients, um, we have that on the next slide, how that looks. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you'll enter information on who the parties involved are. So first, you'll search for the applicant or grant recipient to see if they're in the system. All public housing authorities should be loaded into HEROES, so when you're working with RAD, you should find them here and be able to link the review to them. Um, one quirk, the search option is pretty finicky about organization names, so um, it's probably best to search for them by location rather than name. Um, so type in the location, uh, then press search. Um, there will be a table of everybody who meets your search criteria. Um, so select the, the correct row and press the select button and then they'll be imported over here. Um, so if it is a public housing authority, their PHA code will appear and the review will be kind of successfully linked with them. Um, then you'll just type in the name of the HUD preparer or TBD if you don't know who it is um, and it information on the consultant organization. All right, so this screenshot shows how all of that will look if a partner entered information for RAD and multifamily following the instructions on the cheat sheet. So uh, note how the pull downs end up looking. Uh, once you're done, you'll scroll down to the bottom of the screen and press save and continue to move on to the next screen. Um, so, all right, say you're not sure what to enter for project name, even though I technically just told it to you. Um, there's a little blue circle with an I in it. When you click on that, it gives you more information on that field. And you'll see these throughout HEROES. Um, so keep an eye out for those. These text tips can be helpful, um, a little more helpful on some fields than they are on this one. Uh, but keep an eye out for those. I also want to draw your attention to the side menu. Uh, the side menu is dynamic. It depends on the project's level of review and some of your selections. So it will not appear when you first start a review, but as you proceed through the screens, it will appear and then gradually expand. So once the review is underway, you can use the side menu to navigate through the screens. Uh, just be careful to always scroll to the bottom of each screen and press the Save button. If you use the side menu without first saving any work, then you will lose your entries. So it's always important to save your work. It does not automatically save. All right, this is your next screen. Um, here you'll define the project description, uh, project location, and all the activities involved. This is also the first screen with an upload button, uh, so you'll be prompted to upload any maps or basic project information here. Um, again, the cheat sheet gives you the details on how to complete this screen um, as a partner user. Um, I'm not going to go through all of that one. Um, but this is a reminder of how to complete a good project description. Uh, it's critical to provide a clear, complete picture of a project scope so that HUD can effectively understand and evaluate its potential environmental impacts. Uh, without a good project description, it's really impossible to do a good environmental review. So this is the foundation of the whole process um, so that we know everything that's involved and we can evaluate the impacts. 
All right, once you've got the project description, you can make a preliminary determination of the level of review. Partners can't make the final decision about a project's level of review because that decision has to be HUD's. Uh, but you can make a preliminary selection for HUD to confirm later so you can move on with the rest of the review. If you do have any questions, take them to HUD right away so that you don't make the wrong selection, uh, which can really slow a project down. Again, the cheat sheets are going to give you information on how to determine a project's level of review. Um, but while we have you, we're going to go through some of this. Uh, part 50 outlines four different levels of environmental review uh, for HUD projects. Under NEPA, the default would be for all projects to require an environmental assessment or EA. However, HUD has outlined certain types of activities that are categorically excluded from NEPA. So if all activities included in a proposed project are categorically excluded under Part 50, then a full NEPA review is not required. The lowest level of review is categorically excluded, not subject to 50.4. Uh, these are projects without environmental impacts so the environmental review requirements are pretty minimal. Uh, refinances are CENST if the project is already in HUD's portfolio and any physical activities are limited to routine maintenance. So that includes all 223A7s and a very small number of 223Fs, uh, basically only those that are acting like a 223A7, the ones that are already in HUD's portfolio and are limited to routine maintenance. If you're unsure of what qualifies as routine maintenance, um, we have a memo that defines it, and we will give you a link to that in the cheat sheet. Uh, RAD projects are never CENST because we always consider them to be kind of new to HUD's portfolio. Um, under Part 50, CENST projects only need to comply with our flood insurance requirements. Um, so in case the floodplain has moved since the project was last evaluated, you'll need to check the flood insurance rate map and obtain flood insurance for any structures located in a special flood hazard area. There are also some additional map guide requirements for CENST projects, um, and Sarah's going to talk about those later on. So the nice thing about HEROES is that it figures this out for you. So if you indicate that a project is a CENST 223A7, uh, it will direct you straight to the flood insurance and housing requirements screens without making you determine which laws and authorities are and are not required. Next, we have categorically excluded subject to 50.4. Sorry, I spent a lot of time here. <laughs> um, projects are CEST if all physical activities are limited to minor rehab. Uh, generally, this is going to be 223F and RAD transactions without any new construction or major rehab. Again, the distinction between minor and major rehab uh, for purposes of level of review is defined in the cheat sheet. It's also outlined in HEROES. If you indicate that a project is CEST, uh, you'll have to confirm that any rehab meets the regulatory definition or the regulatory requirements of categorical exclusion. Uh, CEST projects must comply with all the related laws and authorities listed in 50.4, uh, which you might recall as Part A of the 4128, and some additional map guide requirements. Our last level of review that comes up regularly is the environmental assessment. Uh, this is generally any project including new construction, demolition, or major rehab. And again, this is the default. So if a proposal includes one or more activities that is not categorically excluded, it would require an environmental assessment. 221D4s and RAD transactions with major rehab, new construction, or demolition are going to require an environmental assessment, or EA. Um, in addition to the related laws and authorities in 50.4, uh, EAs require the full NEPA review. That means you need to evaluate what we call the EA factors and the EA analysis. Um, and this roughly corresponds to Part B of the 4128. But HEROES is a little more thorough than the 4128, so you'll need to answer some new questions. Um, and Sarah is going to talk about that more later on. Another twist for an environmental assessment is that an environmental clearance officer has to be given the opportunity to review and comment on the review um, if the project affects 200 or more units or beds. And finally, our last level of review is the environmental impact statement. Uh, this is required for any project affecting 2,500 or more units or beds. Um, if it's found to have a significant impact on the human environment, or in some cases, if the noise analysis finds that the project is an unacceptable noise range. So these are relatively rare for HUD projects, so we don't have an EIS format in HEROES. If it does come up, you'll want to contact HUD as soon as possible. And this is what the level of review selection looks like in HEROES. Next slide. Um, you'll need to select both, both the level of review 
and if it's categorically excluded, the specific categorical exclusion in Part 50 that says this project doesn't require a full NEPA analysis. So if it was a 223A7, you would select this checkbox. <laughs> um, 50.19B21 is the one that applies to this type of project. Um, if you're doing a minor rehab project, you would select categorically excluded subject to 50.4, um, and then these are the selections for multifamily rehab, um, and there's one that specifically mentions 223F, so that would be your selection for a 223F. Um, finally, down at the bottom of the screen, we have environmental assessment and environmental impact statement, uh, because you don't need to choose a citation for those. Um, you just would select the level of review and save and continue. And back to Sarah. Okay, so thanks, Liz. Liz just mentioned the laws and authorities at 50.4, and hopefully you all recognize this list. Here they are. Um, Liz is going to go through in a little more detail what this looks like in HEROES, but for now, just know that um, these can be partner initiated, but HUD must finish off each law and authority. And each of these laws and authorities has a hero screen that walks you through exactly what compliance level is required and what documentation is required. So again, it's a helpful um, uh, system that gives you a little more guidance than just a blank 4128. One thing that I really wanted to point out to all of you is that um, HEROES is designed for all program areas. So Liz has mentioned this a number of times today. It's designed to be used by the entire country and all different HUD program areas, not just multifamily FHA and RAD. So um, HEROES will not capture all the nuances in the map guide or the RAD environmental guidance. So at the top of the screen, there's a list of additional MAP requirements. These are uh, you know, required by both multifamily FHA and RAD uh, staff. So examples are you know, looking at fall towers or um, complying with uh, asbestos requirements. Those are additional on top of the list of the laws and authorities that we just talked about. HEROES actually does capture this list. There's a special housing hero screen and when you have picked a housing program so rad or or 221d4 or 223f this screen will automatically um, show up the housing specific screen and a little bit later in the presentation we'll show you what that looks like so those are pretty much covered in the second half of this slide we note a couple of um, laws and authorities where the map guide goes beyond what the regulation requires so HEROES follows the regulation, and if you follow the HEROES prompts, you'll be in compliance with the regulation, but not necessarily with the MAP or the RAD program. So for example, contamination requirements, a big part of the MAP guide is explaining how to comply with contamination requirements. All of that will not, you won't be prompted for any of that in HEROES, so you have to know the MAP guidance and um, put in your own documentation or know what additional documents you need to upload in HEROES. Another example is the explosive and flammable hazards. So the regulation for that only applies for new construction or rehab that's increasing residential densities. So in HEROES, you'll be prompted with the question, does your project include new construction or rehab that increases residential densities? And if you say no, that's um, then you get to a final screen where you have an opportunity to upload documentation and put in comments. Um, you'll be done as far as the regulation is concerned, but the map guide requires that you look at acceptable separation distance even for existing projects. So here's another case where you'll, you'll need to know, and in that compliance screen, you'll need to put in information about how you looked at uh, the accept acceptable separation distance. Okay, for RAD, there are a couple additional requirements too. So again, RAD uh, follows the map guide, except uh, in terms of contamination, that there's a choice of whether to do a phase one or in, you could instead do an ASTM transaction screen. And then radon testing is encouraged but not required. So when the housing screen comes up for RAD projects, you need to know that the guidance is a little bit different than, than the map guide there. 
Okay, so Liz, will you walk us through the related laws and authorities? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so once we get all of that into HEROES as a partner, uh, things can get a little bit complicated. Um, so there are ways in which HEROES was ready for partners, and there's way where we places where we still have some gray areas that we're going to have to kind of muddle through together. Um, for each of the related laws and authorities listed in 50.4, um, like Sarah just went through, uh, we have a separate screen in HEROES. Each screen directs you through a series of dynamic questions uh, that prompts you to help you determine whether the project complies with that requirement. You might only have to answer one question, or you might have to answer five or six, depending on whether there are any potential complications with the project. When you've gotten through all the necessary questions, as HEROES determines, uh, you'll be directed to the screen summary, where you'll enter a compliance determination and upload all of your documents. As a partner, you can and should initiate HUD's review of every related law and authority listed in 50.4, as well as the additional map guide requirements. Uh, for many of these, you should be able to figure out whether the project complies with that factor, and HUD will confirm that we agree with your conclusions and that you have provided sufficient documentation to back up your conclusions. Uh, so factors like that that are pretty smooth work pretty well in HEROES. Uh, you can complete those screens, leave any notes or clarifications that you have for HUD in the compliance determination, and upload all necessary documents. Uh, from a technical standpoint, the only thing that you can't do on the related laws and authority screens is make the final decision about whether formal compliance steps or mitigation is required. This is the last question on every screen, and it will be grayed out for you so that you can't make a choice. As a HUD preparer, we'll have to click through each screen and demonstrate that they have checked your work by responding to that question. And in a couple of slides, we are going to show how that looks, so don't worry if that doesn't really make any sense yet. Um, oh, go back. <laughs> Not right. <really. laughs> um, the problem that comes into the laws and authorities um, is where there are steps that a partner can't take. For example, partners should not begin Section 106 consultation um, under the National Historic Preservation Act. They shouldn't do Section 7 consultation under the Endangered Species Act or do the eighth step under Part 55. Uh, similarly, on any factor that requires mitigation measures or other changes, you can make suggestions, but the final decision is going to be HUD. If you recall the partner worksheets, those cut you off at the point where you had to stop what you were doing and turn the reins over to HUD. Um, and unfortunately, HEROES doesn't have that level of specificity or clarity, so we need to have some workarounds. HEROES requires users to respond to all system-generated questions on each screen before you can upload documents. Therefore, where you have documents to upload, uh, but you're not legally able to comply with all requirements, you should respond to all questions using your best assumptions and suggestions. So in the compliance section, uh, compliance determination section at the end of each screen, describe any assumptions you made and clearly state which responses are merely preliminary or suggestions for HUD. Then HUD will review your recommendations and notes and uh, use them to finalize the screen. Um, so we're going to go through an example of that um, in a second just to show how that looks. But, oh, last slide. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is the screen summary where we summarize compliance with all the related laws and authorities. Um, after you've selected the level of review, you'll be directed to this screen. Again, it will only show the laws and authorities that are required for the level of review you selected. So if the project is CENSP, uh, you'll only see flood insurance and housing requirements here. Otherwise, you'll see the full range of laws listed in Section 50.4 as well as the housing requirements screen. This table itself is not editable. It only summarizes information that you entered on the individual related laws and authority screens. And you can access those screens uh, by clicking the hyperlinks in the left column. You can also complete the screen in any order. Um, in the right column, you can see the compliance determinations. Heroes generate some preliminary language here, but you should edit that text to elaborate on your conclusions. And in the middle column, it shows the responses to the questions, are formal compliance steps or mitigation required? Um, this will still be blank when you finish up your analysis because you cannot answer this question. Only I can do that. All right. Now let's look at an example of one of the trickier factors, the floodplain management screen. Each screen will look about like this when you first arrive. Uh, you'll see a summary of that law or authority at the top of the screen and a link to the HUD exchange. Um, most of these links are old, so they say they're going to go to one CPD, uh, but they redirect to our current website. One CPD was our website when we designed HEROES. Um, once you get 
uh, you'll get one question at a time, and after responding to each question, you'll press next to proceed to the next question. Um, you should respond to each question as completely and accurately as possible to determine whether the project complies or can with mitigation comply with that law or authority. So um, the floodplain management screen starts with an unusually difficult question, so in some ways it's not a good example, but um, it asks whether an exception in 5512C applies. Now, if it did, you would select the applicable citation here. So if you were working on a project that was rehabilitation of a waterborne vessel that will be used for transportation or cruises, you would select 5512C11 and press next. And at that point, you would be directed to the screen summary because that project is exempt from Part 55. Um, of course, if you select that for RAD or FHA multifamily, uh, we would not be very happy with you because that's not an eligible activity under these programs, but I have seen it happen, so please make sure you read the whole thing before you make the selection. In this example, the project is not accepted under 5512C, um, so they press none of the above and would press next. Um, the project is also in a 100-year floodplain, as evidenced in the ferment they uploaded here. Um, and no exceptions in 5512A or B apply. Click. So they continue working through these questions, um, and that indicates that the project has to complete the eight step process. This means a partner cannot complete the full analysis because only HUD can take responsibility for that step. Um, so oh, you click here, see up here that's in red, you get the instruction to up a completed eight-step process, which you as a partner will not be able to do until HUD has completed it. Um, and then the next question creates kind of a technical problem. Uh, you'll be prompted to describe all the mitigation measures, and you have to enter text here before you can get to the screen summary and upload your documents. However, mitigation measures will not be officially defined until after HUD has completed the eight-step process. So, um, again, in situations like this where you have documents to upload but you can't legally comply with all requirements, um, you should respond to all questions using your best suggestions from HUD. So it's important to be very clear about what is only a suggestion or a recommendation. So we ask you to set it off in some way like we did here by starting the comment with notes from partner in all caps uh, to be very clear about what is only a suggestion versus what's a final answer. When you've completed all your required questions, you'll be directed to the screen summary uh, to summarize compliance. A compliance determination will be automatically generated, uh, but you should use this space to leave any notes, comments, or suggestions you have for HUD. Oh, and you can highlight it. You, click there. Yeah. <laughs> you could probably find that. Um, again, it's important that these comments are clear about which responses are final and which are only advisory. Uh, below that, you can upload all of your supporting documents. And as you can see, the final question on this screen is grayed out and cannot be answered by you. Um, a HUD user will have to come in after you to complete the screen by answering this question. All right, so you might recognize the partner worksheets, which we made to help partners uh, submit project information in a way that is consistent with HEROES before you were actually able to use HEROES. Um, unfortunately for us now, the worksheets are a little clearer about what a partner can and cannot do than the screens and heroes are, so you might want to refer to these worksheets for help if you aren't sure about what steps you can and cannot take. Um, next slide. There are a lot of individual prompts to upload documents and heroes. Um, you might have noticed a couple of them just on the floodplain management screen. There's at least one on each of the related laws and authority screens, and there's also one or two on a lot of the other screens as well. For example, the project summary screen prompts you to upload sitemaps and other basic project information. In some cases, you'll get a generic prompt to go along with that upload. For example, upload any supporting documentation here. In others, you'll get something more specific, like upload a flood insurance rate map with the site marked, or upload a completed eight-step process. So it's important to be aware of those prompts. Um, in some cases, you'll need to use a little judgment to decide whether an upload is required, optional, or not possible from a partner user. For example, when HUB says to upload a flood insurance rate map, that's required. And it should have the site marked. Uh, when it says to upload an eight-step process, that's a required step that has to be done before the environmental review is finalized, um, but you'll need to leave it for HUD to actually complete. And upload 
any documentation is generally optional. So use your best judgment to determine whether an upload is really required or whether your answer speaks for itself. Um, so for example, on a lot of the screens, the first question will be something like, does this project include any new construction? If the answer is no, you'll be prompted to upload any documentation. If you if you provided a good project description at the outset, that should really suffice as an answer here. HUD should already know, based on your project description, whether the project includes any new construction, so you wouldn't need any support documentation. Uh, but in some cases, you might want to upload documents anyway. Uh, for example, on the wetland screen, even if you indicate that the project doesn't include any new construction or ground disturbance, you might still want to provide a wetland map so that HUD is aware of the presence or absence of wetlands in the project area, even if the project already complies with Part 55. It's also really important that you upload all documents in the correct space. Um, so upload, upload your floodplain map on the floodplain screen, wetland map on the wetland screen, phase one on the toxics and contamination screen, et cetera. In the past, we've been a little lax on this, uh, but we're kind of cracking down and requiring that you all upload all documents where they are requested, so on the appropriate corresponding screen. This will enable HUD to review your documents easier and faster and will facilitate the environmental review and make it all go a lot more smoothly. So the next few slides, we're going to look at those related laws and authorities that we anticipate creating the most potential confusion as we roll out to partners. Um, these are basically the instructions on the cheat sheet, so you'll have that there as well. Uh, we'll start with floodplain management, which I've talked about a lot. Um, you should create a format with the site marked, determine whether the project is in a floodplain, and make a recommendation to HUD about whether any exceptions in 5512 exempt the project from Part 55 or the eight-step process. You should not complete the five or eight-step process yourself, but you should assist HUD with those processes. HUD will then review all of your entries and documents here and complete the eight or five step process as required. Um, wetlands is fairly similar. Here you should provide a national wetlands inventory map showing the project's proximity to any wetlands. If there are wetlands, you should work with HUD to decide how to proceed. Uh, HUD will decide whether to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service about any wetlands or require a wetlands delineation survey. If there are wetlands on the site that require the five or eight-step process, again, HUD will complete that process. Endangered species, it's a little different. Uh, partners should not consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service or National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, when you're in HEROES, you'll make a preliminary suggestion about whether consultation is required. And if HUD determines that that consultation um, is appropriate, uh, you'll help with assembling all the consultation documents, but contact with the services should go through HUD. Uh, finally, probably the most complicated factor here is going to be historic preservation. Um, just like endangered species, you should not be contacting any consulting parties, including the SHPO, and it's especially critical that you never contact tribes directly. When HERAS prompts you to select all consulting parties and make an effects determination, you should make preliminary suggestions. In the compliance determination, describe your assumptions and conclusions, and upload all documents that are available at that point. For example, National Register documents, site photographs. Then HUD will complete any consultation and make the final effects finding. In all cases, Can I, HUD must... I'm sorry. Oh. Go sure. ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we caught this uh, just this morning. This is actually one area where the map guide is slightly different than the language in HEROES. So I just wanted to point out that the map guide does allow um, lenders and their third parties to assist HUD by submitting a preliminary letter to the SHPO. So that's an area that's a little different, but once you get involved in actually consult consulting or working on an MOA, HUD must be uh, the, the the lead, but there is room for that preliminary step, uh, and that's in 9.5D of the map guide. Thanks. Um. So in all of these above, HUD is going to review and independently evaluate all of your entries, uh, following up on anything that's missing or incomplete, and then correct anything. Um, and that's all in addition to any steps that have to be completed by HUD, like consultation and effects findings. And thank you, Sarah. And now back to Sarah. Okay. And, and just to make sure that that was clear, I'm only talking about uh, a, pr a preliminary reaching out to the SHPO it's still the case that HUD must do any and all outreach to the tribes. Okay, so thanks, Liz. And here's now this 
the screen uh, that I talked about earlier, this is the housing requirements screen. So it's uh, not quite as detailed as the law and authority screen, but it still gives you a little bit of information to help determine what kind of compliance steps are needed. This one covers lead-based paint, asbestos, radon, and then additional hazards and nuisances. This screen actually pops up, Liz mentioned earlier, it pops up at all levels of review. So even for a 223A7, you would get directed to this screen. Um, again, for RAD, you will never have a categorically excluded not subject to. So this is now I'm just talking to multifamily FHA projects. But this screen, then, uh, if you could go to the next slide, um, we put together some guidance to help you. So if the screen pops up even at this very low level of review, um, this gives you some guidance about what kind of compliance we expect. So it pops up because radon testing is always encouraged, even if it's not required. So there needed to be a place for that information to go. So if you're doing a 223A7 and there is a radon report, that would get filled in on the screen. If not, um, pretty much nothing is required. For 223Fs that are already in our portfolio and not doing any work beyond maintenance, as Liz described earlier, um, you do have to comply with lead-based paint. Again, radon is encouraged, so if you have the report, it would go here, and asbestos and nuisances and hazards are not required to have any additional documentation. So this might be helpful and um, as, as a reference. Liz also mentioned environmental assessment. So I wanted to spend a couple minutes on this um, while we have you all here. So um, as Liz said, environmental assessments have requirements beyond the laws and authorities that we just talked about and beyond the additional MAP requirements. So one example are the environmental assessment factors. That's what you're seeing on this screen here. This is the same as the Part B of the old 4128 form, so this is not new. Um, however, seeing it in HEROES it has been surprising to some people, and this is an area where I think we have some growth needed both internally and externally on uh, completing environmental assessments. If you take a look at 9.5Q of the MAP Guide, it states that HUD will require information on these factors. So HUD is expecting that partners will initiate uh, putting in documentation and uploading uh, a backup documentation to support that in this section on environmental assessment. And then just like the other um, laws and authorities, HUD staff will review, um, supplement, ask questions, um, like anything else. We do have some EA factor guidance. And so if you type in um, your search engine, if you type in HUD Exchange Environmental Assessments, you'll go right to this page. And what you want to click is the fourth bullet down where it says Environmental Assessment Factors Guidance. And that gives some good overview of what HUD is looking for with the environmental assessment factors. In addition to an environmental assessment factors, there are actually some other questions that come up with an environmental assessment. I just wanted to spend a minute about this one because we've noticed that it's been confusing internally, and so we're thinking it'll probably be confusing to you all also. This screen has two questions. Um, the first is asking about project justification, and the second is asking about existing conditions and trends. So the purpose and oh, I'm sorry, the, the overall question is project justification. The per first question is purpose and need. I'm sorry about that. So what we're looking for there is how will this project address housing needs in the community and putting in information about the market demand is fine and we'll answer that question. The second question is a little bit different. That's asking about existing and trends in, at the project site. So there we're looking for information about character, features, resources of the site and the surrounding area. So examples might be, is the site in a historic district? Is it untouched farmland? Are there streams and natural areas on or adjacent to the site? Is it at the confluence of four interstate highways? Um, all this information helps set the stage for the review that follows and alerts you and the HUD staff to things they need to consider in the EA factors and the laws and authorities. Um, this also asks about trends. 
So for example, is this an industrial area that is already developing? That would be something to note. Um, in contrast, if it's the first project going into an industrial area and it's surrounded by ongoing industrial uses, that's a very different existing uh, trend. So that's the information we're looking for there. And more to come on EA um, compliance, but we wanted to share a little bit of information today. So Liz, I'm gonna head it back to you for some heroes hints. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, important to note, especially when you're working on those EA factors, uh, because that's a big screen with a lot of text, um, to save your work a lot. Um, this is probably the biggest complaint we get about heroes is that if you um, stay on a screen without um, moving around for 20 minutes, you get logged out due to inactivity. This is the HUD security protocol, uh, and we can't change it, even though heroes should not be a high security operation. Uh, but we have no control over this. So make sure that you're keeping busy or saving your work up a lot, um, especially after you've gotten this warning once. Uh, make it immediately save everything, because even if you press the continue button, all bets are off. You might get logged out at any time. Um, so be really wary about that. Uh, we just added a lot more save buttons throughout Heroes to hopefully make it easier to continue saving your work. But note that Heroes does not consider uh, typing to be activity. So if you've just been typing for 20 minutes, uh, it will read that as an activity and it'll log you out. So make sure you're constantly saving. All right, when you're done with all of your analysis, you'll be directed to this screen, which summarizes mitigation measures and conditions entered previously on the review. Uh, mitigation measures will be collected in this screen based on your entries in the related law and authorities and environmental assessment screens. And it isn't always really intuitive where these get pulled from. It depends on the specific uh, questions and your individual responses on each of the related laws and authority screens. So if you see anything in the column on the right that you want to correct, uh, you can click on the name of that authority on the left and you'll, uh, you'll, and you'll be directed to that screen so you can make corrections. Um, if there are any other mitigation measures or conditions that aren't captured above, but which you'd like to recommend, you can add more here by pressing the Add Mitigation Measure button uh, just below that table. And if the project does require any mitigation measures based on your entries, uh, you'll be prompted to enter a mitigation plan uh, detailing responsibilities for completing any required mitigation measures. So as partners, you might not be equipped to answer that question, so you can just enter placeholder in this text box. Um, if you don't enter anything, you'll get a warning that looks like this, these pink ribbons at the top and bottom. Um, keep an eye out for those on every screen. The screen is pretty easy because you can see the top and bottom of the screen at the same time. Uh, but there are some other screens where you might just kind of find yourself pressing save and continue and nothing's happening. Um, it's a good thing to scroll to the top and check to see if there is a warning for you at the top of the screen about a field you missed. Um, all right, and we've just about made it to the end. Um, after the mitigation measures are done, you'll be directed to this screen to kind of wrap things up. If you press the Generate Preview of Environmental Review Record button, you'll get a pop-up window that will generate a Word document version of all of your entries. Um, so review that document, make sure that everything looks the way you want it to look, and then save that document for your records. You should also submit that document to HUD for the, our files as well. Um, we ask you to do this even though it's only a preliminary version um, because it's relatively easy for HUD to accidentally delete text that you entered in some places. So we need to have your environmental review record as a backup in case we accidentally delete your text from within HEROES. Um, so once you have your environmental review record ready, press the red Assign Review button in the upper left to assign the review to HUD. Um, there it is. Uh, and before we get into assigning reviews, uh, our next slide shows what the environmental review record, the Word document, looks like. Uh, so your uploads will appear as hyperlinks here. You can see a couple of them in this example. Uh, the good news is while it's really easy for us to accidentally delete text in Heroes, it's very hard to accidentally delete documents. So there's a low risk of losing those. Um, but if we do lose text, um, we'll want to be able to copy and paste it from here. 
there will inevitably be some blank spaces in the preview that you generate um, as the environmental review record won't be complete when you're done. Um, there are screens like the certifications and the finding screens that you don't have access to as a partner, so those fields will still be blank. Now, as I mentioned, each review in HEROES only has one assigned user at a time, and only the current assigned user can edit that review. Oh, yeah, here's more of what that environmental review record looks like. And remember to save it and email at the HUD when you assign the review. All right, sorry. <laughs> um, when you're done with your part of the review and you're ready to pass it on to another user, uh, you can go to this screen at any point to assign the review. Uh, we're guessing that in most cases you will be assigning reviews directly to HUD, uh, but it's also possible that you'll want to assign it to another partner user first, uh, which could come up for a few different reasons. Uh, for example, if you and someone else from your firm have divided responsibilities for the environmental review, uh, for example, if there's a specialist taking care of contamination or historic preservation, you might share the review between the two of you. Um, or on a RAD review, if the Public Housing Authority wants the opportunity to review the environmental review before it's assigned to HUD, um, you can do that through HEROES as well. That isn't a requirement, but um, if the PHA wants to do that, that's, that's great. They can do it. You can assign the review to them. So uh, when you're ready to assign a review um, to HUD, here's where it should go. Um, and we don't have this on the slide, <laughs> so write this down. Um, for RAD transactions that have a HUD readiness transaction manager, assign the review to the readiness transaction manager. For all transactions that have a non-HUD readiness transaction manager or when in doubt, assign it to Alan Kaufman. Um, that's where those should go for RAD. For FHA, we haven't sorted out where who you should be assigning it to quite yet, uh, but we will provide you with detailed instructions uh, closer to May as we get into the rollout for you all. Um, oh, go back. Oh, sorry. Um, so when you know who you're assigning it to, search for them by first or last name, and their name will appear on the upper table along with their role, email address, and location so that you can confirm you have the right person. Alternatively, there's a table in the lower half of the screen that shows all of the review's previous assigned users. So if you're the person who started the review, it's just going to show your name, and that isn't very helpful. Um, but this will save you a step if you're assigning a review back to somebody else who has already assigned it. So click on the name of the person you want to assign the review to, whether they're in the top table or the bottom table, and then enter any comments you have in the text box provided, and press Assign at the bottom of the screen, and the review will go to them. Uh, so after assigning the review, uh, both you and the person you assigned it to will receive a confirmation email with the name of the review and any comments you entered. So once a review has been assigned, um, the only person who can reassign it um, is the current assigned user or a user with admin privileges. So if you make an error when assigning a review and need to get it back, you'll need to get help to reassign it. Um, so it's a very good idea to reach out outside of Heroes before you assign a review just to make sure you don't assign it to somebody who's on vacation or retired or unavailable um, because then you're going to need to get somebody with admin privileges to help you. Um, so I want to draw your attention to the assignment history screen. Um, you can get to this from the My Environmental Reviews dashboard by pressing View Assignment History. Um, this will show you everyone who has been assigned a review, when the review was assigned to them, and any comments uh, that were entered by the person who assigned the review to them. So keep this in mind. Uh, it's important to be careful about any comments you enter when you assign a review to someone else because everyone can see those comments forever. Um, next, all environmental reviews are posted on the HUD exchange. Um, because environmental review records are public documents that the public has the, the right to review. Um, so be mindful, make sure that you're not putting anything private that shouldn't be on a public-facing website into an environmental review record. Um, <clears throat> if you do catch anything, make sure that HUD is aware of it so that we can fix it. Um, but these do get posted up here for one year after they're completed. Uh, and they stay in HEROES forever, so don't worry about environmental review records getting deleted after a year. Um, they're just publicly available for one year. Um, our next slide, if you don't yet have HEROES access, uh, we, you should have emails that tell you how to register. 
um, if you're watching this in the future, um, <laughs> check our main HEROES website. Um, we'll make sure to keep that updated with information on how to register. Uh, but for now, you should have instructions on how to register in your email. And now we're going to go through resources on HomeStretch. Um, <laughs> This slide, which I forgot to format, uh, I'm covering up a URL here, um, has basically all of our HEROES resources. The main uh, HEROES page is the one that you can't see all of right now, but if you Google HEROES without the E, or without the second E, um, and HUD Exchange, you'll get to it. Um, we have a user guide, um, how-to videos. These are like five to eight minute videos that walk you through a discrete aspect of how to use HEROES. So um, if you're struggling with a particular screen or you know, how to assign a review, um, something like that, a short how-to video would be of help. Uh, we frequently ask questions that we update fairly regularly. So if you find uh, something's acting buggy, it's a good idea to check the frequently asked questions. There's a troubleshooting section in there um, that can help. And we are pretty good at keeping that updated. Um, ask a question um, is a resource if you're if you check the frequently asked questions and you're still not able to resolve your issue. Um, we assemble all of your questions there, so it's the best way to get a technical question dealt with. Um, and then there's the links to the worksheets as well. You need those. Uh, this is our main um, page in the Office of Environment on the HUD Exchange. A um, couple things to highlight here. Um, if you want more information about any of the related environmental laws and authorities, you can press View Resources at the very bottom of this slide. It's kind of actually in the middle of the screen. Um, and that'll take you to tailored websites for each of the related laws and authorities. Um, you can also find heroes under Featured Topics on this page. Um, unfortunately, this is kind of an old screenshot. There's actually a lot more Featured Topics now. Um, so I should update this. But one featured topic that you can't see, but I want to alert you to, is Wiser. Um, click through. There's where Heroes, actually that's not where Heroes appears anymore. It's now like the second featured topic, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the Wiser modules are um, a new thing, a relatively new feature of our website. Um, these are some self-paced learning videos and knowledge checks. So if you want a little more information on any of these aspects of the environmental review process. Um, the WISER modules are a great way to catch up. Um, and then our next slide is the program resources. So uh, quick links to the map guide and RAD transaction guidance. And then I think here is quick links to the link to log into HEROES. Um, you won't be able to actually log in until we send you your login information. Um, but these are kind of the four most useful links. And then finally, uh, where to go with questions. If you've got technical questions about heroes, those should go to ask a question. Um, those, uh, and ask a question, we won't take really project specific questions, but uh, we deal with any issues related to using heroes. If you have any project specific or more substantive environmental review questions, talk to your HUD program contact. Whew, and I think we're ready for questions. <laughs> So Liz and Sarah, thanks a million for going through that. Um, so we're gonna, uh, we've been monitoring the questions that have been written um, as we've gone along and we've got a several teed up. And so Robert, do you think you have a few that you wanna start with? Sure, yeah, so um, one is a, a question about A7s. It says if environmental professionals are not conducting assessments on A7s, who's putting the information into HERO systems now at the moment? A7s only have a capital needs report. What would the capital needs assessment now need to input A7 information? So. Sarah, do you want to? So I'll take that one. If if you're not doing it now, HEROES shouldn't change that need, and that would be inputted by HUD staff. In, excuse me, input by HUD staff. Um, and then the other question that's that's out there is, how soon after the HEROES is approved does it show up on the public exchange section? Um, when HUD um, does its part of the environmental review, it's kind of the last thing we do. So um, I think Greg presses that after he signs. Right. Yeah. So um, 
in rad, Greg is the approving official and he signs off on those reviews. So his signature is kind of the last thing that happens and then he presses the archive button. I think that's how you do it or is there mm -hmm. a delay? Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a delay on the FHA side where they don't post it until a certain thing has happened. Sarah or Dan, can you jump in there? As they're looking, but for RAD, once I press the archive or whatever, it's immediately available. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, I think on the FHA side, they you don't archive it until something else has been approved. It's not just the environmental review. There's something else, but I'm not. Okay. <laughs> then we've got I'll have to look into that list. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. We would leave it um, and, and then... Uh, uh, sunset it once it's uh, the result, the disposition of the application has been made. Does that make sense? Did I hear the question correctly? I think so, Dan. Yes. <laughs> that sounds yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Who is the responsible editor? So who is the responsible? <laughs> um, so. Today we were just talking about part 50 reviews and there is no responsible entity. Um, sorry if I let any of that slip through. Uh, responsible entity is a concept that comes up in part 58 reviews, which is where HUD um, authorizes a unit of general state or local government to perform the environmental reviews and they take legal responsibility uh, for the review and HUD um, isn't really involved. So um, that comes up under public housing, um, Office of Native American programs and community planning and development grants. Um, they have a responsible entity which be a unit of state, general or local government, or tribal, um, who uh, does the environmental review. So if you do work with any of those um, parties, then you could work with a Part 58 review um, once we roll out to them. So it's a FHA processing question. So the question is, for FHA transactions, is the expectation that the third party will assign the review to a lender with the lender then assigning to HUD? Or is the expectation that the lender will review the, the entered information another way, such as printing out the report? I can yeah, take the latter. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dan. I, I would say the latter. So the third party is is sending it directly to HUD, but obviously the lender would, they would want to review it with the lender um, before submitting it. Does that make sense? And Sarah, did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. I think so. Again, this will be more fleshed out closer to May, but at this point, it's it's an option. The lender could choose to um, get Heroes access, and then they would be able to review the submission in Heroes and be able to link and open all of the documents right there. Or um, the third party could print out that summary and share any documentation separately. Um, you wouldn't be able to follow the links, but you could see all the compliance determinations. And so it's really up to each lender how, how they want to proceed. Right. I think the point, though, is the system would be set up where um, uh, the third party report comes in and can be seen, but not uh, edited by the lender. That's correct. Yes, it'll be a view only access for lenders. So Liz, I think this is a follow-on to our <laughs> responsible entity question, but the question is, there, we're a RAD PHA, our city government conducts a review, how does the Part 58 work? Do we initiate as the partner and then they complete the review? So. Yeah, it would be roughly the same process that we described today, but replacing HUD with a responsible entity. Um, so we're not ready to do that quite yet in HEROES, uh, but we do intend to roll out um, to that scenario to the Part 58 public housing um, grants or environmental reviews later on this year. So stay tuned on that. All right. So the follow-on question about Part 50s and 58s. So 50s, 50s are today, Part 58s coming attraction. Yeah. And not all Part 50s today, just RAD today, right. multifamily production soon, and then uh, the rest of Part 50 to come after that. Great. We like to take everything in very small batches when we do heroes roll out. <laughs> Are there questions? No other questions? Okay. Um, all right. So um, uh, the question box is dry. Uh, so we'll 
wrap things up, um, again, uh, I want to just thank um, Liz and Sarah for a great job sort of introducing us to the Hero system and getting us ready for this, sort of for where we are now. And, um, uh, and thank Dan always for your wise sort of uh, input. And uh, uh, and thanks all our partners. Uh, we really look forward to um, uh, sort of seeing these uh, new Part 50 submissions coming in through uh, through Heroes. We think will make uh, our transaction life a lot a lot easier. So with that, um, uh, thank you everyone.